You may be seated. Afternoon. Um, we call the case of Williams versus uh, Mancello. I have counselor here. Are there any preliminary matters for the court? Okay. All right. Your panel this afternoon to my right is Judge Hunter Murphy. To my left is Judge Darren Jackson. I'm John Tyson, and we appreciate you being here. And uh, if there's nothing further, we will hear from the appellate. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. May it please the court, counsel. My name is John Holden from the law firm of Dickey McCamey and Chilcote. I am here on behalf of the appellant. I apologize, Your Honor, my glasses fogged up. You're fine. Uh, I am here on behalf of the appellant, Marshall Allen, Niles Anthony Raines, Bronwyn Young, and Emergency Medicine Physicians of Mecklenburg County, PLLC. My client, Emergency Medicine Physicians of Mecklenburg County, PLLC, is a provider of emergency department physicians, physician's assistants, and nurse practitioners. We provide staffing at hospitals. We do not operate hospitals. Emergency Medicine Physicians of Mecklenburg County represents 3,000 physicians and providers in 220 locations across 19 states. We see approximately 6 million patients annually. And that is why the issues in this appeal are so important to my client and similarly situated clients. The practice of medicine has changed in the 21st century. It is no longer simply a local doctor opening an office after medical school. Medicine is practiced in large, integrated, multi-state practices and hospital systems. By way of example, Atrium Health, which is the hospital where this care took place that's at issue in this case, has 7,000 employees in 42 different hospitals across multiple states. The largest healthcare network in the United States, HCA Healthcare, has 180 different sites where they provide care. They, provide, they have 280,000 employees and see 35 million patients a year. The reason that this is important to this appeal is because the, the question of the application of the scope of General Statutes 90-21.22a. That is a statute that pr protects medical review committees for these types of entities. There were already protections in place in the state of North Carolina under uh, General Statute 131E76 for hospital-based peer review committees. But the providers in those types of peer review committees have to be licensed in the state of North Carolina. These types of multi-state systems require protection for their peer review systems, for their medical review committees. As the court is well aware, the purpose of a peer review committee is to ensure the quality of care for patients. So it is imperative to allow that system to go forward unimpeded by fear of litigation. If, if plaintiff's attorneys are able to invade peer review, then it will become a situation where the providers will feel the need to protect themselves from claims that the decisions that they made were poor in the past, so they'll never improve them in the future. It will have a deleterious effect on the development of medical knowledge in America. And it's especially true for these multi-state, multi-site hospital systems because the information that they draw from one site can be used to improve care in another. And medicine is different than the law. Medicine is uniform state to state across the United States of America. The human body is the same in Arizona as it is in Alaska. The law is not. 
So these entities need a way to protect their medical review committees so that they can ensure that the care that they provide is uniform, is high quality, and continues to advance over time. Mr. If Mr. Holden, um, you brought the appeal because you're asserting there was ever there was error and prejudice in the trial judge's ruling. Correct, Your Honor. Um, <clears throat> there seems to be a dispute between counsel over the proper standard of review of the trial judge's order. Correct. There is argument for an abuse of discretion standard of review, and there is argument for a de novo standard of review based on interpretation of a statute. I'm not going to direct your argument, but uh, do you think it's threshold that this court understand what the proper standard of review is on uh, Judge Bridges' order? I think it is important, and, and there's a portion of my argument later when the question of what exactly is before this court and what this court is being asked to decide will arise. And I think whether it's abuse of discretion or de novo really comes into play at that point. Our position is simply that this is a de novo review. We asserted a peer review uh, under the case of uh, Bryson versus Hayward Regional Medical Center, Moody versus Sears Roebuck and Company. Uh, the assertion of a bona fide privilege is reviewed de novo. Uh, that is the position of my client. That is our position here today. It is not an abuse of discretion standard. Well, generally, the admission or denial of, of testimony or that would be within the trial judge's discretion. Do you at least acknowledge that? I acknowledge that. And if this were a, dis a discovery dispute that did not involve the assertion of a privilege, in other words, if we had, it, as they did in some of the cited cases in, in uh, Appley's brief, argued relevance, uh, burdensome, that it was unduly burdensome to produce it, I would agree that we'd be here on an abuse of discretion. But because it's a interpretation of a statute, and particularly this, the peer review statute, the medical review statute we've raised, we think it's de novo. So be, the assertion of a privilege as a bar to comply with an order to compel or disclose, that, that whether or not that there is a privilege would be a question of law for the court. I believe that's correct, Your Honor, yes. Okay. If I understand your question, that's correct. So why did Judge Bridges get that wrong? What Judge Bridges did, in our opinion, and this brings up the question that I just raised, so if I could, I, I apologize for answering in a somewhat lengthy way here. But the, the question that, that is on my mind when, I, when this appeal was written is, is, are all the questions that were raised in the briefs applicable? So we're, we had a dispute about whether the peer review committee was properly constituted, whether they needed to be licensed, whether privilege was waived. Those issues are not reached until you get past the threshold issue of why did Judge Bridges not uh, even attempt or to discuss the privilege. So the error that we claim is that uh, counsel brought a, a Rule 37B motion. We opposed it with a bona fide assertion of privilege, and we brought forth affidavits and evidence uh, at least to raise the question of whether that privilege applied. Judge Bridges' mistake, in our view, was not addressing that question at all. Instead, he referred back to Judge Irvin's earlier order and said that that order, which d required disclosure of a single document under a different claim, a claim of work product privilege, somehow covered this, thereby ignoring the assertion of peer review privilege. And I'm using peer review privilege generically, Your Honor. I, it's technically medical review under the statute that we've cited. So we think that that deprived our client of their right to be shielded by the peer review statute and essentially did an end run around that by, and didn't address it in, in the in oral argument before Judge Bridges. The question of what was he doing with this peer review statute was specifically raised. I was the person arguing that day, as was Mr. Boyle. And at the close of the argument, I said, Your Honor, I respectfully, I understand your ruling. The, the prior order applies and it's in order to enforce under Rule 37B. But what, what, do, you, what do you make of, of, of the privilege statute? Did you argue, are you, is your position that we waived it? Is it your position that it doesn't apply to this document? Is it your position that the committee wasn't wrongfully, wasn't properly constituted? And I said to him at the time, I would like to define the parameters of the argument, and I don't like to say this to a trial judge, 
I said for the Court of Appeals. For what exactly why we're here today, so that those issues can be addressed. We can understand the scope of your ruling about the privilege that I've raised, so that the court can rule about whether it's properly asserted. But since those ant questions were never raised, no findings of fact were made, no conclusions of law, and it was a bare bones, Rule 37 uh, is enforced, you were supposed to turn this over, turn it over. I'm trying to get an analogy on an assertion of privilege because the legal profession also has a privilege as well. Certainly. Very similar to the patient physician privilege, the attorney client privilege. So if I'm in a law firm and I talk to a client and then I go talk to my partner in the law firm about that client, is that communication privileged? If it were sought by a uh a litigant later to the discussion between the two partners? Or from even from a third party? A third party, I think, would be different if you, because you certainly can waive privilege. I mean, we all know that if, if I were in the room with my client and my wife were to come into the room, for instance, and sit down with us, that would break attorney client privilege. We understand, you know, that the client can always waive the privilege. Correct. Help so if, if he's litigating against an attorney and wants to know what that attorney told a law partner, that's not the issue. What we have here is a third party, is that correct? A third party in the sense that, yes, there, is, there was a, the assertion of privilege is the medical, the Central Medical Review Committee of Emergency Medicine Physicians of Mecklenburg, of, actually it's not of Mecklenburg County, it's, it's Emergency Medicine Physicians Central, which is located in Canton, Ohio, uh, is the employer of Marshall Allen. Marshall Allen submitted electronic data to them uh, and that is the documented issue, so that it is being sought by the patient's widow. Okay, now that, that document is not in our record, is it? Uh, Even under seal? It is not in the record, Your Honor. I have it with me. I don't know if it would be helpful for the court to review it. If it's a de novo review, it's certainly within your purview to do so. I brought a copy just on the off chance we would need to bring it in. Well, you know, we are limited to the matters that are before us in the record. Right. And if, if a party wants to file a motion to supplement the record, or, an, you know, if there was an objection to the record on appeal, that would have had to have been filed long ago. So the fact that it's not in the record before us, uh, it's not properly before us at this time. So I just wanted to know, I just wanted to make sure that it was not an oversight or a mission that it was not included in our record on appeal. No, Your Honor, you are correct. It is not in the record on appeal. What was included in the record on appeal is a placeholder. So when we filed the motion, um, or when we filed our opposition to the motion under Rule 37B, we filed a piece of paper that says Sealed Exhibit 1, and that is what is contained in the record on appeal. It does not contain the actual document. Is it relevant? I don't think it's necessarily relevant, Your Honor. No, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think there's too much dispute about what it is. And I think counsel and I are even in agreement about what it is. It is a document that was generated from electronically stored data that was sent by Marshall Allen. And I am not, uh, as it may appear in my reply brief, and it has been brought to my attention, I am not making the argument that it is not a document because it's electronic. It is a document. It is, it is an electronic document within the meaning of the rules. So that is not a position that we're going to be advancing here today. Getting back to the main issue before us, um, why should, based on the assertion of privilege, why should this document not be turned over to the plaintiff? Under 90-2122A, the, the proceedings of a medical review committee, the materials it produces and the materials it considers are shielded from both uh, discovery and admission at trial with the caveat that you cannot shield something by submitting it. It has to be part of the work of the committee. So I cannot take the medical record in this case and submit it to a peer review committee and then argue with a straight face to anyone that this is all now privileged because the peer review committee has, has reviewed it. This was a document that was created by Marshall Allen at the request of her medical director, Dr. Niles Reigns, for the purposes of quality review for the medical review committee. Well, so is we, that what it was? Or the affidavit talks about risk management. Isn't that a suggestion that's going to the insurance company or something like that? How would somebody that's just dealing with something that says risk management think that it's going to a peer review committee? Well, the, uh, I assume you're discussing the, the, the affidavit of Justin Otwell. Justin Otwell is an attorney. 
I, I, I'm talking about um, uh, Ms. Allen's affidavit. Right. That, that follows that. It was, it was submitted as a risk management document. She did not know where it went to because she's not privy to that. But D Justin Otwell, who is the uh, attorney for EMP, so he is an in-house counsel for them, stated that the documents submitted in that fashion go to the medical review committee. So that is, so she really didn't know. She just went to a computer terminal, entered the requested information, hit send, and, and it went off to them. And then he knows what happens to it from there, Your Honor. If I have, if I go to a doctor for treatment and basically isn't there a record made of a diagnosis or a summary of the visit with me that that is part of my medical record, is that correct? Absolutely, Your Honor. If you, you go to the, then there is a medical record in this case for the treatment uh, for Mr. Williams, and that has been exchanged in discovery, and no privilege claim has been made as to that document. Okay, so would, the, would a physician or health care provider normally include um, impressions or something that a client said or even or a patient said, or even someone who was with the patient, observations, would that normally not be included in the treatment record or the summary? It often is in the treatment record, and most physicians who I represent, if someone says something during the course of a hospital visit or a doctor, they will put it in quotes in the medical record, so it's a patient states, my leg started hurting yesterday afternoon after playing softball, something along those lines, and that would not be privileged, that would be part of the medical record. So if my spouse is with me and... Um, she tells the doctor, you know, this has been hurting him down for over a year, and I've been begging him to get to a doctor. Would that be, a, would that be something that would normally be included as well? Yes, Your Honor. That's, that's history. That's correct. It, it, for instance, just to, by way of example, in this case, uh, when Mr. Williams came to the emergency department initially, he told Marshall Allen that he had hurt his hip and back playing golf, or at least he thought he had. It turned out, tragically, that wasn't the case. But that's exactly what Your Honor is talking about. And his wife was with him at that time? She was. Hania Williams was present for both visits. And she made statements as well? She made, and Your Honor, I, I don't know whether there's any statements of hers contained in the initial medical record, to be honest. You caught me flat-footed on that one. No, it's Later not, on, trying, she, not trying to trip you up. I'm no. just... When she returned to the emergency department uh, the, the following day, um, on the 7th of May, she made statements to... Uh, Dr. Niles Rains that are part of the subject of the appeal, but I don't recall honestly if she said anything that's included in the treatment record. Well, I, okay, I, I'm trying to draw a line between what would be discoverable, what would be turned over, even statements of a third party, a family member present during treatment, as opposed to statements that are subject to some type of standard of review internally within the medical practice. Can you help draw a line between those two? Certainly. So th the statements that are made taking, so ordinarily when you come into the hospital, take a history and a physical. That's part of your medical record. It's in every medical record that we see. That is for purposes of diagnosis and treatment of the ailment that brings you to the emergency department. That is not for purposes of standard of review. And if that record were submitted to a peer review committee, it wouldn't matter. It would be discoverable anyway. But a peer review committee's job is different. A peer review committee's job is to judge the performance of the provider and whether there is room for improvement. So what they are submitting to a peer review committee is, what did you diagnose this person with? Were you right or were you wrong? What, what tests did you order? Did you order the appropriate tests or not? Uh, and did you arrive at the appropriate diagnosis? And, did you, and basically, did your care fall beneath the standard of care or standard for quality improvement in the future? So those questions are submitted to the peer review committee who then meets and comes up and says, there's, either there's the care, met standard, the, the care met standard of care, the care did not meet standard of care, or met standard of care, but there is room for improvement, and we recommend the following three things be done differently next time. So that is not for purposes of treating the patient, it's for improving the provider. Like an after-action report? That's almost exactly what it is, Your Honor. It's, and that's how medicine evolves, because they find out that this provider gave this medication and it got a better outcome than that provider. So then they recommend all of the sites. We recommend these, these antibiotics instead of those antibiotics. So it would be like emergency you know, repairs after the fact? Yes. Yes. It's, what it is is, I just had this argument in, in a different setting, it's subsequent remedial measures. 
are subsequent remedial measures admissible to prove a deficiency in the first place? Typically, they're not for that exact reason. You want medicine to evolve. You want the practice to get better. And this is intended to improve the quality of medicine as it goes along based on actual patient experiences. Mr. Holmes, I, excuse me one minute. I didn't ask you about any rebuttal time. Did you want to reserve some time for your rebuttal? Five minutes, Your Honor. Okay. Jane, okay, thank you. All right. Mr. Holden, let's assume I, I, I'm going with you on everything um, and its application here. I still can't figure out how to get past the language in 90-2122A-A1 that a committee composed of health care providers licensed under this chapter and your argument that that can include people licensed outside of the state and not licensed under Chapter 90. Correct. And, and I think, the, the, let me outline my thinking there a little bit. So what we have is, we have the peer review statute, 131E, and that clearly is hospital-based. They have to be licensed in North Carolina. We're not disputing that. But the legislature has two peer review statutes with very similar purposes. And our position is the reason that this, this peer review statute exists is to allow exactly what happened here, a centralized peer review committee. And in Chapter 90, the terms are not defined for this particular statute. It, and there's very little case law in this statute. I, I believe between, co between uh, Appley's counsel and myself, we've read all the cases. There's not much out there. But so we, we don't need case law if the language is, is plain that it's licensed under this chapter. That can only be people licensed in North Carolina. Is there something else in Chapter 90 that I'm missing on being licensed under our statute? Well, the definition of health, the word health care providers, Your Honor. There, there's a definition section at the beginning of Chapter 90, and it does not include that phrase. But it only applies to that article. It doesn't apply to this Article 1D, correct? Well, By its specific terms. I mean, the, the legislature could have removed that language or omitted that language, but makes that definition only applicable to that, that one article. In the absence, I, I understand that, and certainly that's Appellee's argument that it only applies to that particular article, but that's the only place it's defined in the chapter. So there's no, it either leaves us with no definition or a definition in the chapter which arguably doesn't apply. And that definition is a health care provider licensed in this state or otherwise licensed. And as Mr. Otwell said in his affidavit, these providers who reviewed this were otherwise licensed. So these are licensed medical providers. But I agree that if the statute were written differently with its own set of definitions, this question wouldn't be open. I would argue it is open and we took the only definition that was available to us. I think that Ruling, ruling out licensed medical providers in a uh, in that definition is is there's just unfortunately there's no textual support for it. But let me ask you this: you, you, you're talking about you know this is the way of medicine. We're talking about you know more of a national review with with these bigger uh, medical providers. But hasn't our, our legislature basically gone against that? policy and that flow anyways by requiring a localized standard of care and not a national standard of care in determining liability in the first place? So why wouldn't that also apply to this using only North Carolina license, people licensed under this chapter in North Carolina? So what the business model, we don't care, we're talking about localized care and, and they're clear about that when it comes to liability. Why, why not interpret their their plain language to to support that policy versus a policy they have clearly not endorsed. Your Honor, you're absolutely correct. There is no national standard of care, but there what there is is a standard of care based upon the provider's resources. So, for instance, in this case, does the statute say same or similar community? Yes. So the plaintiff's expert in this case is from Florida. She's testifying in the North Carolina courtroom as to care that was rendered in North Carolina. I, I view this as, this as the same or similar idea. As long as you understand what the setting is, the same or similar community, you cannot compare, you cannot compare Duke, you know, academic, one of the finest academic institutions in the United States to a regional hospital in Asheville. That is not a fair comparison. But you may be able to compare it to Chapel Hill because they're comparable. So in this case, I think that the legislature has not made a determination that you cannot compare state to state. They say it has to be a fair comparison. And I think that in this case, making them be licensed medical providers allows for that and says you must have licensed medical providers reviewing licensed medical providers. You're reviewing Marshall Allen's care. You need licensed medical providers to do that. Was Ms. Allen licensed in North Carolina? She is. She's a, a nurse practitioner. I'm sorry. She's a nurse practitioner here in, in uh, North Carolina. Is Dr. Rains licensed in North Carolina? They are. Yes, Your Honor. 
And they were the ones who provided the care? That's correct. She, she was the one who had provided the hands-on care. He was the supervising physician. And when Mr. Williams returned to the hospital, he provided the hands-on care the next day. What about Dr. Young? Dr. Young is an interesting situation. Dr. Young never saw the patient. Dr. Young's name appears in the chart because of what are called standing orders. I can certainly explain what that is, but essentially a, a, a right. doctor. Right. Is he licensed in North Carolina? Yes. Okay. All the providers are licensed in North Carolina. Okay. But the, 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 the members of the peer review committee might not necessarily be licensed. Is that what you're, the point? Is That's that, correct, that Your the Honor. They, they are, the peer review committee sits in Canton, Ohio, and since um, USQ Care Solutions practices in 19 states, they do not have representatives, small 19 states, on that peer review committee to review state-specific care. They review care from throughout the United States. And I think that's important, Your Honor. Does the record demonstrate that a single member of that committee is licensed in North Carolina? It does not. It does not. All, all the, uh, the affidavit of Justin Otwell indicates is that they are licensed medical providers who reviewed the care. I did not, and this is another point of contention that came up in the briefs, how much to reveal about the peer review committee to establish the privilege. It's an open question because if you go too deep into it, you need to start explaining the proceedings of the peer review committee, which is shielded by the peer review privilege, sort of a, a loop. Uh, how much information, but no, I, I am not going to tell this court that even one member of that committee was licensed in North Carolina. I do not have that information. When Judge Irwin issued the first order, uh, did, was this issuing before on the uh, discovery order that he issued? I'm sorry, Your Honor, I'm not sure I understand your question. Judge, Judge Irwin had issued a prior order, correct? Correct. And this, the order that's before us was basically a motion to compel? It was the order that's before you was a motion to enforce under Rule 37B. So they could, so plaintiff's counsel could have moved under 37A to compel, as he did the, for the first document, but instead moved to enforce under Rule 37B, arguing that this document was covered by the prior, and I apologize, you know, this is not, um, that it was covered under the uh, prior order of Judge Irwin. Is that not an issue of fact? that we should defer to the trial court's findings, especially here where we don't see that second document in our record. I'm, I'm looking at, at the order, paragraph one. Trial court says it is what was referenced in Judge Irvin's order. It needs to be handed over. Why is that not an issue of fact when, when the trial court was the only one in position to compare the documents and decide if it was or was not what was covered under there? During both of the arguments, Your Honor, there was a um, sealed document involved. So when the, when the first motion was argued before Judge Irwin, I handed Judge Irwin the three-page document, which was withheld under the claim of, um, of work product doctrine. He reviewed that on the bench, made commentary about it, and ordered it exchange, finding that the risk of litigation was not so imminent as to justify withholding it. Similarly, when I appeared in front of Judge Bridges, I handed up document sealed exhibit one, which is the subject of the motion here today. So the trial court had an opportunity to compare those two documents to each other. Uh, they are very distinct and separate documents, and I really don't know that there's, there is an argument that they were somehow switched out. I'm not sure I entirely understand that, but they were generated in different, at different, um, different ways, kept in different ways, distributed to different people. I think that they are factually distinct in the record. What should, our, what should our standard of review be, however, regarding if I interpret this order as um, Judge Bridges saying this is what was covered by Judge Irvin's order? I, I think because of the assertion of privilege, it tips it from abusive discretion to de novo. I think you would review that de novo, Your Honor. Judge Bridges' order is on page... Um, on volume two near the end, the order appeal from the second, the first paragraph of that order, he ordered that <clears throat> the order was to remain under seal in, in that clerk's office pending an appeal, and if appeal is taken, to be maintained there until the outcome of the appeal is completed before actually producing it. Is that why it was not included in the record, even under seal? Uh, 
There were two reasons, and that was one of them. The other one is I don't know that the, that the nature of the document itself or the contents of the document itself s says anything that would have an impact on the analysis. Uh, but yes, it is, that document has not been turned over. Um, it is still under seal. And as I said, um, the, other, the prior document was turned over after Judge uh, Urban's order. What, what deference, if, if I'm a trial judge sitting on this record, on these motions, and this assertion is made, how should I proceed? What deference do I give on the statute to the, um, to the Medical Review Committee? I mean, how, how do I weigh that privilege? I think you need to recognize in, in, in the first instance that a good faith assertion of privilege has been made. So I think that you have to you have to analyze the situation. Is this the sort of situation where this privilege is applicable? Because if I was trying to protect the medical record, for instance, it wouldn't apply in the least. So you have to wonder. So you have to ask: Is there a good faith assertion of privilege? Is this the type of document that fits within there? And then allow me to produce evidence in support of it, which is what I did. Produce the evidence. Produce Mr. Otwell's affidavit. This document was produced in this way. Produce Ms. Marshall Allen's affidavit. This is what I did to generate the document. Uh, and then uh, accept criticism. Uh, listen to uh, what able, co able counsel here has to say. Say, accept his claim that, it, that they needed to be licensed in North Carolina. Analyze the situation and rule. But that's the problem. There was no ruling. If he had said to me at the close, I believe that you, are, you asserted privilege in good faith, however you waived it. You asserted privilege in good faith, but your committee is, is not properly constituted or some other analysis, then at least when we were sitting here today, we could, you could look at that situation and determine whether that is, was legally a proper decision or not. But he sidestepped the whole process by going back to a, a, a document that was not withheld under this statute. It was withheld under a completely separate legal theory. I don't want to get into your rebuttal time. If you want to take just a few seconds to summarize, uh, then you can keep the remainder of your time for rebuttal. Okay. To, to sum up, I think the, the, one of the reasons that uh, we're here today is the policy implications of this. And I think the policy implications of this are significant. There is not a lot of case law that's developed on this statute. I think it's an important statute, and I don't think that the legislature enacted it without reason. I think the reason they enacted it is, is to protect companies uh, like my company, large hospital systems like Atrium, and I think it's important not to strip the privilege away from providers without giving them a chance to be heard. You can win or lose fairly if you get a hearing on the question of whether the privilege applies. Unfortunately, what Judge Bridges did here was, was determine that an arguably privileged document should be turned over without ever analyzing the privilege that was being asserted. And I think that that's the error that, that we're dealing with here. And that's what I think calls for reversal or at a minimum a remand for findings. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. We're going to reset. Hear from the appellee. Good afternoon, Mr. Ball. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Welcome to the court. Thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> may it please the court, my name is Ellis Boyle, and I represent the appellee, Hanya Williams. My client respectfully requests that the court affirm the trial court's decision. Now, there are some facts I'd like to go over very quickly, unless the court wants to jump into things. Obviously, happy to answer questions. Uh, you know, the, the, the court is familiar, I think, with the facts of the case, but we don't want to direct your argument, and so you can choose to. The, so, the court has a question. We're not afraid to jump in, Mr. Paul. <laughs> God bless America. Uh, so let me just jump in, if I can, uh, to, to specific from um, the argument made in the August 29th hearing, it's very important to, to keep these second. The August 29th, Rule 37A, motion to compel. And that was based on the newly disclosed privilege log from July 11, where <clears throat> defendant's lawyers, after answering discovery questions that asked Mrs. Allen, have you ever been investigated? Tell us everything that you wrote or said about this patient. And she, she didn't disclose anything about any um, incident report that she sent to risk management department. And that's what it is. It's an incident report that was sent to risk management 
using EMP software, a template on the EMP system. It wasn't peer review. There was no peer review committee. This happened, remind you, uh, this happened on May 9th when she wrote this, when Ms. Allen wrote this. Mr. Williams saw Ms. Allen on May 6th. She sent him home saying, hey, you got back pain, even though there was the unusual lineal calcifications to the right and left of his spine, which in that area, likely vascular in nature, which she cut and pasted from the radiology report into his medical record. There's only one thing that could have been. And I don't know if you all know what a triple A is, but it's an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And what it means is your aorta, the big pipe coming out of your heart, going down toward your legs, it's a big bubble in it. And if it gets too big, it bursts. And when it bursts, you bleed into your abdomen until you die, or if you're lucky, they can fix you. So she sends him home with a big triple A. Again, cut and pasted the radiology report into his medical records, but just gives him pain meds and says, see an orthopedic surgeon. Was that apparent from the radiology report? Absolutely. It literally says, Your Honor, unusual linear calcifications to the right and left of the spine in the retroperitoneum, likely vascular in nature. Again, maybe that doesn't mean anything to a non-doctor, but if you're a doctor, that's telling you your aorta is not only so big that it's going out on one side, it's going out on both sides, and your spine is fairly big. Right, Your Honor? So if your aorta is typically within the spine and it's bubbled out on both sides, you got a big triple A. <clears throat> so she sends him home on May 6th. He's taking the medicine on May 7th, about a day, a little over a day later, it bursts at home, and his wife calls the ambulance. They rush him back to the same hospital, and Dr. Raines finally takes a CT scan, immediately sees it's a ruptured aorta. Um, and they, they try and do the life-saving surgery. Unfortunately, it didn't work. He bled to death. Um, so that's May 8th at about 3 a.m. in the morning that he dies. She comes back to work, Miss Allen, at, I don't know, 7 a.m., I think she said, on May 9th. So about a day and a half, maybe 18 hours later, they hadn't set up any peer review committee. And, and even if they had, you don't know that because there's nothing in any affidavit that says that. There's no peer review committee that meets within a day of somebody dying. They're, they're just not that good. Uh, and, and even if they had had a regularly scheduled meeting on May 9th, they probably wouldn't have known about this instance. And there's no evidence. When you look at Mr. Otwell, the lawyer, the risk management lawyer from Ohio, who, remember, never said he worked for EMP, said he worked for acute care solutions, EMP is a different entity that was acquired by Acute Care Solutions at some point, I believe after May 9th, after this incident. So this guy, the lawyer from Ohio, is saying, hey, I work for Acute Care Solutions, but I'm familiar with what was happening. And, and curiously, in his affidavit, he doesn't say that he even worked for EMP or even Acute Care Solutions back in May of 2016, but he says he's aware of what happened then. He doesn't give any details. He doesn't say... And when you look at his affidavit, he doesn't say the peer review committee told Ms. Allen to create this for the peer review committee. And I know I'm jumping ahead here. I, I think the court is interested, does it actually apply? Does the peer review privilege actually apply? Now, I will tell you that it doesn't matter because that was waived when in the August 29th, 37A motion to compel hearing, the defendants failed to raise that issue. In August 29, they show up in court and they talk to Judge Urban about uh, a document that Ms. Allen filed with the Risk Management Department. She says, Dr. Raines, not the peer review committee, Dr. Raines told me to send uh, the template incident report on the risk management site to the risk management people. In fact, that's what she says later on in her affidavit that they used at the January 31 hearing, the second hearing, the 37B hearing. She still says, I sent it to risk management. She never says, I sent it to peer review. The only person that says vaguely that it was sent to peer review is the lawyer from Ohio who wasn't present, at least you can't tell from his affidavit, when that happened. Mr. Boyle, let me ask one question before you move on from there. I just want to be absolutely clear. The defendant's privilege is only asserted under 90-21.22a a1 and not a2 correct so we're only looking at a1 of the statute 
the Medical Review Committee versus Quality Assurance Committee? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. And <clears throat> to the extent that there's a difference between the, that 9221-22A peer review committee privilege versus the hospital one, the 131E privilege, they actually, and, and, and this is completely backwards from the way the defendants briefed it, the 131E privilege is actually more, it's easier to meet. It doesn't say anything about having licensed under North Carolina under this chapter. Instead, what it says is you have to be on the medical staff at the hospital. And I, I, I don't know this for sure, but I would imagine you could be on the medical staff at a hospital and not be licensed under North Carolina Chapter 90. But it doesn't matter because when you look at 902122A, a1, it's very specific that you must be licensed under this chapter. And I believe, uh, Your Honor, Judge Murphy brought this up. <clears throat> what that meant, first of all, it's just unambiguous statutory language, so it doesn't really need modification. But if you actually look at the other section from a different article that Defense Counsel briefed at 9221.11, that is a different article. And, and you, you will know this perhaps from actually serving in the General Assembly, but the general statutes are chapters, chapter 90, that's the whole thing, and then there are sub-articles within it. Did the definitions in chapter 90 apply to all of the, all of the chapter or not? To the extent that they say they do, they do, but I don't believe this is defined, this isn't a defined term. And again, it says licensed under chapter 90, and if you look at the brief that we filed, Your Honor, there's a footnote that goes through, I forget, it's exhaustive, like 38 different, you could be a podiatrist, you could be a, a, you know, a, a speech therapist, a doctor, a physician's assistant, nurse practitioner. There's, there's something like 38 different things that you could be to be licensed under Chapter 90. Interestingly, not a sociologist. But a funeral uh, director is. What's that? A funeral director. I think that was one of them. Yes, Your Honor. So again, and, and, and you know, uh, you could have a weird circumstance, I guess, where there's a properly constituted 90-22-21A peer review privilege committee with funeral directors. I, I, it would at least meet the statutory language, unlike what we have here. I ask uh, your, your uh, counsel on the other side, what is our standard of review here? If it is de novo, because we're interpreting a statute, or if it's abuse of discretion, uh, he makes the argument that it is a de novo review, question of law for the trial court, as opposed to an abuse of discretion, because the assertion of a privilege is a question of law. Do you agree with that? No, Your Honor. It is. Uh a, a, an abuse of discretion review, and I'll explain why. If the court wants to take up an actual investigation or discussion of the peer review privilege, I don't disagree that it can do that de novo. But it shouldn't, and it doesn't need to. And I, if, you, if I may, I'd like to say why. W would the application of a statute be a de novo review as opposed to abuse of discretion? Oftentimes, yes, but, but uh, I hesitate there, Your Honor, because 37A versus 30, Rule 37A versus Rule 37B is a statute. Was Judge Bridges correct under either standard of review? Both. Both. Uh, Why? Again, the first hearing, the 37A motion to compel, what they described was an incident report sent to risk management. Judge Irvin heard all of that argument. They, by their own decision, chose not to make any peer review arguments in that. And, and I'll, um, it, it's pretty clear from the record in that um, if you look at appendix pages three to six, this is in the August 29 hearing, the first hearing. The court said, I gather there's no claim this is peer review. Mr. Holden said, well, there is a claim of peer review in the sense that this may have been part of the peer review process, but because I'm not part of that and it's not part of this lawsuit, but I'm not claiming that as the primary basis for privilege, I'm claiming material prepared in anticipation of litigation. So, the, and, and that was in the privilege log, too, that they produced in July prior to this August 29 hearing. They said peer review. Uh, so 
they knew about the possibility of raising it and arguing it. And then you hear what he said to the court on August 29th. He basically said, I'm not going to argue that. And the court on August 29th, Judge Irvin didn't really consider it, but that's because uh, the defendants didn't raise it. So in the second hearing, and so, so the whole thing about the first hearing was talking, talking about the incident report. And then when it came, when they lost, and it came time to actually produce it, what did they produce? They produced document A. And as you know from reading the briefs, when the deposition occurred, document A was literally a diary entry that Mrs. Allen, for whatever reason, decided to write to herself, for herself, without any instruction. No lawyer, no peer review committee, not even risk management or Dr. Raines. Nobody told her to write that on her own computer for herself, but she did. And she kept it for herself. She didn't give it to anyone until presumably right before the July 11 privilege log was produced, after, after she had answered the discovery without mentioning it in March. So that document was not produced either, her diary entry? Her diary entry was produced after Judge Irvin's first, um, after the first hearing on August 29th. She produced that, and that's what led to the questions about that at the deposition. And at the deposition, the questions were posed, okay, so now... What, what did you do with that? Now that you've given us this document, this is the document you sent to risk management, right? And she says, no. And so, what? Uh, I, 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 that literally, up until that, until she says no, plaintiff's counsel was under the impression that was what was sent to risk management. Only at that point did plaintiff's counsel ask, was there a second document? And she says, yes. I typed in a document on the template on the computer and sent it to risk management. At that point, it became clear that the whole argument was about an incident report in the first hearing, but what was produced was not the incident report. That's why when you get to the second hearing, it's not a new motion to compel, it's a motion to enforce that first hearing. Judge Irvin already said, give them the incident report. Document B that was apparently typed up and sent to risk management is the incident report. And I'm saying incident report because it's important, Your Honor. It's not a peer review committee document. And there's very good case law, the Cook v. Wake County uh, Hospital, which is, I think, Wake Med case, that says uh, a hospital's incident report is discoverable. It is also the USAA case. That's an insurance company. But it basically says incident reports are discoverable. Why um, isn't this a remedial or a after-action report that going back to the question I asked proposing counsel, why would it be remedial or measures taken to improve process in the future? I mean, it could be, Your Honor, but it's an incident report that was sent to risk management. If risk management decides in conjunction with or exclusive of and, and just, I don't know how their process works. Again, the, the, the affidavit we got from Mr. Otwell was conspicuously silent about any processes or guidelines or underlying foundation for uh, any peer review committee or risk management for that matter. So there wasn't a standing practice by her employer that she would prepare these action, act, after action reports, for lack of a better word, to enable them to, re, to improve their standard? I have no idea, Your Honor, and neither do you because you haven't seen anything that would suggest that. What you have is a base, unsupported allegation or, or, or just a, a statement by Mr. Otwell that's, that's not grounded. And if, if you look, Your Honor, I think this is important. If you look at cases that it has, that the Court of Appeals has said, you gave us enough information, hospital, uh, we agree that, that this is a, a legitimate, statutorily well-founded uh, peer review that would be the estate of Ray B. Forgey. Uh, and in that case, they, they provided affidavits with the actual ground rules and the regulations and the bylaws that said what a peer review committee is, what it normally does, how it goes about its processes. And the argument's made that if, if, if you disclose that, you somehow waive what happened at a particular peer review committee hearing. That's absurd. It, it, to suggest that we just have to take their word when they say we have peer review committees, that's not the way it works. You have to actually show what the peer review committee is and what the process is. And that's what failed in the Hammond versus Sine case. Um, and I can give you the citations on those if you want. They're, they're court of appeals cases. The 40 is from 2016. 
in the Hammond cases from 2013, Your Honor. They're in your brief, aren't they? I believe they are, Your Honor. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, the question is, did they do something to show it? So, so they, Your Honor, you don't need to address whether there was a peer review committee uh, actually in this case or whether there was a peer review privilege that applies because it was clearly waived by the fact that they didn't bring it up at the first hearing. And that's why the January 31st hearing with Judge Bridges was a 37B motion to enforce, not a 37A motion to compel. Um, <clears throat> But I would suggest to you very strongly, feel free to take up the peer review privilege issue because they didn't even come close to sniffing it, much less proving 100% of all the statutory requirements they have to do. And it's very clear in the existing case law that this is a, a, a derogation of the normal function of discovery and our pursuit of truth and justice in, in trials in the court system if you hide information that's relevant, there has to be a real good reason, like the doctor-patient privilege, uh, and that's statutory too, but so is this. This is a statutory base, and if they don't meet every single dot the I across the T part of it, then they failed, and they didn't prove um, that all the members, or any of the members, or even one or two of the members, we don't know who, how many members there are even, but we certainly don't know that 100% of them were licensed under Chapter 9. And I got a little sidetracked. I wanted to go back to, to the articles versus the chapter. So the, the definition that was cherry-picked uh, at a 90, I'm sorry, 90.21.11 was from the medical malpractice sub-article. So the articles are the subunits under the chapter. That Article 1D, different article than the one for 90-21-22. That's, I think, one, I, I may be getting that wrong. Maybe 1D was 90-21-22A, and the other one is 1B. I think 90-21-11, medical malpractice is 1B. But it literally says, this definition applies to this article, this subunit, 1B. So how can you possibly take that small definition that says, license under this chapter or otherwise, and try and apply it to the whole chapter when it says specifically in that law that it only applies to that article. So by its own terms, it doesn't apply to 9021-22A. <clears throat> Let me ask you this. So is, do, do you think that medical professionals who work together, like attorneys who work together, have a right to record or have their performance reviewed without subject to disclosure among themselves? I think that that, the North, as a general statement. I think that the North Carolina General Assembly has established three different ways that medical providers can engage in peer review conduct and, and some type of uh, self-reflecting investigatory process. And that's 90-22-21-A uh, for sort of non-hospitals. And then there's 131-E, I think 95, that's for the hospital committees. And I forget, Your Honor, what the other one, I think it's another 131, but it's nursing homes, basically. It's what? What's the last one? Nurse, it, it deals nursing. with nursing homes. Um, it's a quality assurance committee peer review privilege for nursing homes, I believe. Um, but you have to absolutely hit every 100% dot your eye across your T. You've got to meet the standard before it applies. And they didn't meet any of them here. Again, uh, I've been harping on the, the license under this chapter, but then there's also the part where it says, um, uh, that failed to pro pro prove uh, the formation and the purpose of the committee. Again, that goes back to the uh, two cases, the Forgy and the Hammond case, where in Forgy they said they, they, they have an affidavit that shows how this was created, how this committee was created and why, and it actually does comply. It's, it supports the reasons. What Mr. Otwell says is he just quotes 90 a 
and acts like that somehow, if, if he's a lawyer in Ohio and he quotes uh, a North Carolina statute, that it somehow magically makes it uh, a legitimate committee. And, and he has to go through and show some bylaws or regulations or guidelines that you simply you have to do that to, to give it some legitimacy. And then the second step is you have to say that's actually how we applied it when we did the hearing and the investigation in this case. They didn't do that. And then the third problem they have is they failed to prove that document B, um, the incident report, they failed to prove that it was created for or by the committee. Now, there's no question if you have the first two steps and there's a committee that's been constituted, does an investigation, and it creates a document. It hears testimony and they write, you know, the committee members write their own findings in their own document. I don't disagree. That's privileged. There's no suggestion that's what happened here at all, and it didn't happen here. The second way it can be privileged is if the committee goes out to the individual doctor, like a Miss Allen in this case, and says, hey, something bad happened. We want you to produce a document for us that we will take control of and use strictly in the peer review committee. So if the peer review committee itself produces it, privileged. Or if the peer review committee goes out and solicits it specifically for the peer review committee, it's privileged. What happened here is Dr. Raines, who's not on any peer review committee, not even involved with risk management, just happens to be a doctor who was working there that day. He says, hey, something bad happened uh, to your patient. You should get on the portal and get on the incident report and, you know, type in the information to the incident report and send it to risk management. And again, that's very clear from Dr. Rain's affidavit and from Mrs. Allen's testimony. And they can't get away from this even even after she testified, when they filed her affidavit to support their argument in the second motion, the 37B motion to enforce, she says it again in her affidavit that she sent it to risk management, not peer review. So nobody from peer review reached out to her and said, hey, you know what? We want to actually get the team together and, and do our thing and do an investigation. Please produce a document for us to use in our investigation. That's not what happened. Dr. Range says, fill out an incident report and send it to risk management. That's what she did. That means that they didn't meet any of the three mandatory requirements to show that peer review actually applies, peer review privilege applies. If she prepared this at the direction of counsel, would it be in anticipation litigation or work product? Possibly. Possibly, Your Honor, depending on the circumstances, which, no offense, aren't really or, Are those facts in dispute that she prepared it at the direction of counsel's request? There's no lawyer involved on May 9th. She, she didn't. That, that's, that's not even remotely what the facts are. There was no lawyer that told her to produce anything. So are you saying that the diary entry she, proposed, she prepared was solely self-actuated? She did that just herself without any direction or anything. Dr. Raines did not tell her to do that by her own testimony. Dr. Raines told her to fill out the incident report. Dr. Raines is not a lawyer. Um, th there's no lawyers involved on May 9th, literally 18 hours after the death. So there, there's no counsel involved whatsoever. And, and document A, the diary entry, by her testimony, I don't take my word for it, Your Honor, that's what she said uh, in her affidavit, I'm sorry, in her deposition. That's how she described it. And the the appellant did not move forward on a theory of um, preparation in this hearing, correct? Or they only they only moved forward on the theory of the medical review committee, or did they move on multiple theories? That's a great question, Your Honor. I know in the second privilege log, which I don't believe is in the record, but was provided, but was produced, that. Um, the two documents were, were essentially the same reasons withheld or peer review um, in anticipation of litigation and attorney-client privilege. But, but again, I mean, they put attorney-client client privilege in that privilege log, and it's just, it's not there. It, it has no application whatsoever, but they put it in there. Anticipation of litigation was clearly the focus of the August 29 argument about her diary entry, it turns out, which they 
described, and Dr. Raines had the affidavit saying incident report, but turns out, I guess, it was the diary entry, document A. And when we say that they swapped out document A for document B, what we mean is they talked about an incident report that was submitted to risk management. That's all they talked about at the first hearing. And then they give us a diary that she admits wasn't given to anybody. So well, on the that's premise, swapping it out. To follow up on what Judge Murphy just asked you, if they asserted privilege on a privilege log three different bases, and I noticed that Judge uh, Bridges did not, he specifically did not enter sanctions. Correct. In his order. So he must have found some good faith, for lack of a better word, or some conduct by the defendant that would not warrant sanctions. And I, the reason I'm asking you that, counsel, is this. It sounds like the, you know, Justice Irwin said, turn it over, and they put it in a privilege log, and you went back for Judge Bridges. We don't have it. And that's where it came. But, and I don't want to get out of where we need to be. I, I don't want to get out of our lane. But if there's an assertion of privilege on three different bases, wouldn't the document, could not the document be privileged on any of those three? I mean, it could, Your Honor, but, but if you say, if you just lie. I understand what the facts are. The facts you're saying is no counsel was involved at the time that either was prepared, Correct. and therefore it cannot be prepared in advance litigation or attorney-client privilege. Therefore, the only thing it can be is peer review. Is uh, that kind of where you're going? Uh, it couldn't be attorney-client privilege, Your Honor. No attorney involved. If, if there's no attorney involved, it's semantically impossible for it to be attorney-client privilege. It's within the realm of possibility for it to be prepared in anticipation of litigation, even if a lawyer uh, is not involved. In this case, that was fully argued, and, and regardless if it was document A or document B, that was fully argued at the August 29 hearing as it relates to filling out an incident report and sending it to risk management. So that, that was completely fleshed out, no appeal made, and uh, again, I, I, I'd ask you to look at the Cook case and the USA case incident reports are generally discoverable. Remind me, Counselor, when the deposition of Ms. Allen was done in reference to the first hearing. Was it before or after? After. First hearing, so, so it was scheduled, um, I believe, sometime in mid-July. July 11, and, and Your Honor, I'm running out of time, so I'd like to answer I'll give you question. a moment. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, July 11, the defense for the first time supplements its original responses and gives the privilege log identifying the incident report that it says was submitted to risk management. At that point... But not the diary entry. You've got it. Well, well, well there was a privilege log, and so the motion was filed to compel based on the privilege log because we wanted to test it because we didn't right. think it was valid. And it turns out when Judge Irwin heard that on August 29th, he agreed, and he compelled. He said, you have to produce it. And then the deposition was, I believe, October 30th, so several months after, after and, and, and document A had been produced by the time the deposition. So we get into the deposition, and I'm asking questions of Ms. Allen, and I say, so this, this is the document. It turns out it's document A. Uh, but at the time, I just thought it was the incident report, and I said, this is what you gave to risk management, right? And she says, no. That's where the mischief began. That's where it started to unravel. And that's what led to the second hearing, the 37B motion to enforce. And that's the order before us now. That's the order before you now. And, Your Honor, um, unless there are any further questions, if I may. Well, I don't have anything else. Any other questions? We'll give you a moment to sum up, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, my client respectfully requests that the court affirm and require defendants to produce document B. The incident report Ms. Allen wrote per Dr. Rain's instructions uh, and submitted to EMP Risk Management Department on May 9th, 2016 that she knew existed from that day forward. And if the court decides the peer review privilege issue, I think it's very clear that uh, these defendants failed to satisfy 100% of their burden, if any of their burden. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ball. Rebuttal.
Before I begin my rebuttal, if the court has any questions, otherwise I'll just kind of launch into it. Any, any direct questions? Okay. You may proceed. The first thing that I want to address is factual. How did these documents get created? Why were they created? What was the, what was the basis for this? Because we never really addressed that in the argument. Let me ask you this, a specific question on that. Um, Ms. Allen, from what I understand, and this is not correct, I want you to correct me, please. She made a diary entry on her own initiative period. Is that correct? Not entirely, Your Honor, and I'll explain why. So what happened was Marshall Allen, uh, as discussed uh, by Mr. Boyle, uh, believed that Mr. Williams was suffering from some sort of mechanical lower back pain, possibly related to playing golf, and did send him home. He then had a ruptured aortic aneurysm, returned to the hospital when Ms. Allen was not working, but Dr. Raines was working. Dr. Raines then saw her when she came into work Monday morning and said to her, do you remember that patient who you treated on Friday, he came back to the hospital with a ruptured aortic aneurysm, was airlifted to CMC Maine, and passed away, unfortunately. And his wife, Hania Williams, was making comments during the, the second visit about, you better not let anything happen to my husband, which Dr. Raines interpreted as a threat of litigation. That's in his affidavit. He believed she was saying that she was going to sue the hospital if anything happened. He then passes away immediately thereafter. That is why Dr. Raines, as the supervising physician for Ms. Allen, talked to her about the situation. When but then let me ask you this, that that's true. Is your contention that's what initiated her to record her events in her diary? I think it's my contention that that initiated her creation of both documents that she went to her laptop computer and created what we're calling the diary entry. And specifically, I could not verify that that was forwarded to a peer review committee, which is why in the argument before Judge Irwin, I said, and the comment was read to you by counsel, this is about material prepared in anticipation of litigation and not primarily about peer review. It may have been sent to a committee, but I couldn't, I can't tell you that. I don't know that. So I'm not going to assert a privilege like that. As to doc, the second document, which he's calling an incident report and we're calling a peer review report, that document is verified that that went to a peer review committee. Does that answer your question, Your Honor? Yes. Um, was that peer review committee established in place or was it, was it formed as a result of this incident? It was a standing committee, Your Honor. It was not generated as a result of this. So in Mr. Otwell's affidavit where he discusses it, and I'd like to go through the affidavit in, in a bit of detail because a lot of these questions came up with counsel. He talks about this. He is the Vice President of Claims and Risk Management. He says, I am fully familiar with the various risk management and quality assurance organizations which were in place at EMP, which was her, her employer, in May 2016. So he has personal knowledge of the committees that, were, that existed. And then he goes on to state that at the time she was seen, EMP had a central medical review committee. It was a committee composed of licensed health care providers, requirement number one, which was formed for the purposes of evaluating the quality, cost, and necessity for the health care services, requirement number three, and per, it also was created and empowered to evaluate and improve the quality of health care services provided by EMP's doctors and physicians assistant. That's exactly what you we were talking about with counsel. That's why this committee existed. This is not a risk management committee. This is a quality improvement organization to advance the practice of medicine. In two paragraphs down from there, he satisfies the third requirement. Sealed Exhibit A, the document that was, ge that was generated on the computer system, was used as part of the proceedings of the Medical Review Committee at EMP and was generated for purposes of that committee. It is not an incident report because counsel is absolutely right. Incident reports made in the ordinary course of business are discoverable. But what is not discoverable is a document that was generated for a standing peer review committee and sent to that committee and that was done through a terminal at the direction of her medical supervisor, Dr. Reigns. So. He, he absolutely satisfies the requirement, and, and the court is, and the counsel is correct. The case is Ray versus Forgey, which incidentally was also Judge Bridges. Uh, and they 
held that if you meet the statutory requirements, which he did in the affidavit, you have satisfied the peer review threshold and the, and the document is shielded from discovery. In that case, the, tri the trial court was reviewed, was reversed by this court. What plaintiff uh, and appellee has done in this case is import various definitions which do not exist. The, the last sentence in the, the peer review statute at issue in this case says that this does not mean a peer review committee under 131E76. It's different, and it's different for the reasons I discussed during my argument. So when he's talking about that they had somehow, uh, the lawyer had to talk about medical staff bylaws and things like that and identify the members of the committee, those are not requirements. I'll Those are requirements moment. in I'll, the in I'll the give other. you a moment to sum up. Okay, in the other statute. Judge so, Tyson, you ask a question? Yes, of course. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I, I believe that the three pages w that you refer to as the diary was handed up to Judge Irwin. It was. It was. Was this document being handed up to Judge Irwin? Document B, no. I, I, in the affidavit of Mr. Otwell, he explains that document B was an electronic document. As I said, not arguing it's not a document. It was an electronic document, and it was not in the possession because Ms. Allen did not have a copy of it. And it was, gener it was printed out and sent to me. It was then submitted to, to, Judge, um, to, the, to Judge Bridges, who had a copy of it, and he reviewed it live during the course of the argument on, on the second motion. But, but the argument that Judge Irwin had already ordered this incident report to be disclosed, he had in fact not seen it. Is that correct? He has not. He had not seen it. Thank you. It didn't come up until after the deposition, I think is what Mr. Bowles said. That's precisely correct. At the deposition, she talked about submitting it electronically and a request was made, please search this database, find this information that she says was, was generated. It was then sent to me and I submitted it in sealed form to Judge Bridges who reviewed it. W one more question. Um, I just want to be perfectly clear on the procedure here. When it comes to document B, I'm looking at record page 272, the only privilege asserted for the document B hearing with Judge Bridget was 90-122A Medical Review Committee, correct? Is there something else in, in this opposition or in the transcript you want to point me to where an additional privilege was argued? No, because it wasn't a hospital-based committee, I didn't use any of the other privileges. Uh, I did not believe that it was prepared uh, under attorney-client or in anticipation of litigation. So that was the claim. 21.22 uh, uh, is the claim here, uh, a, a multi-state medical review committee. What would you have us do? I would have you do one of two things, Your Honor. I would have you either decide that this issue needs further clarification from the trial court and remand it for findings of fact and conclusions of law so that you can properly analyze whether this committee was properly constituted, or I would have you reverse it as he ignored the assertion of a, a uh, bona fide privilege and sidestepped it, stripping my client of their rights to be shielded by a statute passed by the North Carolina legislature, just as you did in Forgey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for good arguments. We appreciate it. Ms. Sawyer, your adjourn, please. All rise. The session of the North Carolina Court of Appeals is now adjourned.
and 